Welcome to LOA Today. Walt Thiessen and Life Coach Wendy Dillard here. Today is Monday, November 27, 2017. And we are beginning a new odyssey within LOA Today circles. We're going to a daily show. And Wendy, that's why you're here, because we need to do a daily show with a co-host who can be here daily. And I, I'm not only excited about that, I'm excited about having you here. I'm excited about what's going to be coming up in the future. It's going to be great. Thank you. I'm pretty excited, too. I have no idea where it's going to go, but I know wherever it goes, it's going to feel good to both of us. And that's really the main thing. That's going to be our theme ongoing. In fact, we even have a positioning statement. We, we have like a, a theme name a, a, or a theme phrase, oh. if you will. Our, our, well, our... I think you mentioned it, but just in case I'm not on the same page with you, tell us what it is. Well, it's, it's your daily dose of happy. That's what oh, we're giving I today. Love... And that's what we're giving every day, I... your daily dose of happy. And I love the word happy. I love the word happy. It's one of those words that's really hard not to like. <laughs> I mean, when well, you when you think happy, you never think anything sad. It's it's not like you can go right to the diametric opposite on that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you want to hear a funny little story about me and my relationship to the word happy? Sure. Okay. So, um, I don't know. It was a number of years ago. I was listening to an Abraham Hicks in a workshop on CD, and they were talking about how when you make happiness your priority in life, pretty much everything goes your way. And I heard that over and over, and I went, huh? <laughs> that like, so it was so foreign to me. I thought that actually seemed silly and kind of trite. And But I thought, but Abraham Hicks, I mean, that's, that's a smart group of conscious, you know, people or entities, and they know what they're talking about, but that one just didn't really connect with me. So time goes by, and I keep hearing them saying it over and over. When you make happiness a priority, you you live in a life of ease and joy. Right. So I thought, well, I want ease and joy, but I'm not really quite sure what happiness has to do, or focusing on happiness, what that has to do with all these things I'm trying to accomplish in my life. I want a great relationship. I want a fabulous career. You know, I want lots of money in the bank. And those things didn't feel like they matched happiness. Happiness to me was kind of this, I don't know, ethereal, emotional feeling. So eventually time rolls by and I keep asking these questions, like what does happiness have to do with it? And then one day the thought came to me, just try it. <laughs> what do I have to lose except Absolutely. maybe being happy, right? Right, of course. Well, I start focusing on it, and I love to do interior design. I'm always looking for things to, you know, decorate my home with. And everywhere I went, Walt, I found some plaque, some sign, some greeting card, some piece of art, and the word happiness and happy or happy was on everything I kept seeing. Nice. I was kind of getting this idea like the universe is trying to show me something. Yeah, I'd so, so. <laughs> I started buying all this stuff, and I have little placards of happiness all over the place, like choose happiness, and happiness will choose you. And again, what do I have to lose? But there were pretty pictures of art, so I didn't mind hanging them around my house. Mm -hmm. But little by little, I started to notice my internal happiness quotient was actually increasing. Wow. And I started using the word happy like I feel happy. And I started to ask, well, how come I couldn't connect to this before and I kind of can now? And I realized I just didn't have the word happy in my vocabulary. Really? Like it was just, yeah, it was just not something I said. Like, for instance, when I was married, my husband used to say all the time that he just wanted to have fun. And I didn't quite understand the word fun. Wow. I know that probably sounds really weird, but like for who I am and my personality, I love to be productive and I love to accomplish things. I don't and think you're all that different from most people on that, actually. You, I'm sorry, say that again? I, I don't think you're really different from most people on that. I, I think actually huh. a lot of people have lost kind of lost touch of, with what happy and joyful and all that really is. And so it's like your question, you know, fun, what's that? <laughs> Yeah, and so, you know, he and I would have discussions about it because I wanted to understand why this thing called fun was such a big deal to him and why I seemed to be completely void of that concept. But I'm not void of the concept. What I realized is I just use different words 
oh. to describe those feelings. So what words do, so, do you use and did you use? I got it done. You wouldn't believe how many things I accomplished today. <laughs> Accomplishment is a really big deal it, for my personality. Oh, okay. And when okay. I accomplish a lot and it had a sense of ease and joy while I was doing it, that's fun. Ah. That is so fun for me. Oh, okay. And so I realized that he and I were just using different words. And in the same context about, you know, a daily dose of happy, happy was just not a word I used very often. I would say things like, I feel satisfied, or I feel really good, or I'm excited. Those were kind of the words I used. So it's not like I wasn't working toward happiness before. I just didn't recognize it with that word. You know, that's interesting, but, be- because when I first started to study the whole law of attraction thing, I-, I had my own, you know, challenges and so forth that I was dealing with, and one of them was I-, I was having trouble understanding how this whole attraction thing worked, and I was rereading all the literature and so forth, and finally, it I got to the point where I realized that happiness was a big part of it. Now, for me, I understood very much what it meant to be happy. To me, that word was a, a, a part of my vocabulary, one that I didn't use often enough, but it was definitely a big part of my vocabulary. But for me, the problem wasn't knowing what it was. The problem was figuring out how to get there. <laughs> so even though I was you know, wanting to feel good and I had begun to understand that this whole thing about the law of attraction requires you to feel good. I didn't know how to get there. I didn't know. I, I mean, I knew how to follow the steps that they that Abraham Hicks tells you, and the Secret tells you, and you know Tony Robbins and everybody else. But I didn't know how to get there. Does that make sense? No, oh, it totally makes sense. Oh, okay, totally. good. Because because it sounds like I'm yeah. stumbling over my own words, so I'm not sure. But, <laughs> but no, and as a matter of fact, a lot of my clients that call me, they call because they've been to the Abraham Hicks, they've been to Tony Robbins, all the people that you've mentioned, they've done all that stuff, but they haven't figured out how to apply the law of attraction in their life to make it work. Right. Exactly. They knew they wanted happy, they just couldn't figure out how to get to happy. In fact, I remember the first time that I heard Tony Robbins back in the 80s and ordered one of his tape sets and so forth and played them all through, I said to myself, but that doesn't work. (laughs) (laughs) Well, <laughs> which probably you know, wasn't the best reaction. But <laughs> what Tony is famous for is his ability to model, his ability to interview people and find out what they're thinking, how they're behaving, you know, in what sequence they do their thoughts, etc. And then, you know, his concept is if you do what these experts and famous athletes do with these beliefs and do it in this order, you should get the same results. And he was. He was getting the results. Absolutely he was, yeah. But it didn't always work for me. And it did sometimes, but not always. And that's what kind of led me on a a deeper quest to try to understand how to get to the successful living that I really desired Mm. in a way that was sustainable. Yeah, you and me too. And, and, you know, really law of attraction is what came into my world and totally changed how I see everything because it took what I'd learned from Tony Robbins and many other brilliant teachers and gave me the Mm how-to that makes it work every time. Yeah, that, that's really good, and yeah. that's important. I know that as you were talking about Tony, and you're right, he was a big, big model, and still is. He does a terrific job mm-hmm. of modeling the success of others. But one of the things that he modeled was he was one of the very first people I ever heard talk about visualization. And mm. when I ran into The Secret, they are talking about visualization again, and Abraham Hicks talked about it, and others talked about it. And i got to tell you, that was one of the largest stumbling blocks for me. And the reason it was a stumbling so, block is not one that you might expect. <laughs> oh, well, I can't wait to hear it then. What, what is it for you? I have trouble creating images in my mind. I'm what's mm-hmm. known as aphantasic, which means that I can usually not create any images in my mind, or if I can create an image, it's very faint, dull, black and white, boring, lack of detail, just not a very good image. I mean, 
Certainly nothing you'd want to publish in Life magazine. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I mean, I, I thought there was something wrong with the formula first. Mm -hmm. And then I learned that other people really can create images in their mind. So then I figured then there's something wrong with me. And I figured either way, it doesn't work. Well, that's, that's a wealthy road to go down. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Let me tell you, it, it is not a happy thing to find out that the vast majority of people can create images in your mind. You can't. What the heck are you going to do when all this positive growth and law of attraction stuff depends on it? <laughs> well, and I want to hear what you're going to say as to how, because I, I think you've told me kind of you've figured out a, a different way to get a similar result. It took a while. But yeah. At but this point, I'll add, even when I was doing the Tony Robbins seminars and he did talk about visualization a lot, I had a hard time visualizing. And I oh, was did. thinking, what's wrong with me? Oh, okay. Because I know my primary modality is visual. Really? Like, yeah, even if, like, while you're talking or even when a teacher would talk when I was in elementary school, I didn't know I was doing this, but I later realized I take everything someone says and turns it into some kind of a visual picture wow. of some kind. Or I see where I store it in my head. Uh -huh. But it's like I see something visual. And okay. if someone just talks and they're very, um, well, maybe monotone, I'm have, because it's kind of, uh, it's not interesting to me <laughs> because if someone speaks in a monotone voice, it's real. It's hard for me to interpret in pictures. Oh, okay. Because someone who's in this, I've learned from Tony and through NLP that someone who speaks in a more monotone cadence in their voice, mm -hmm. there that's because their primary modality is either auditory or kinesthetic, which is feeling. Mm -hmm. Which means they're not speaking through the visual modality, which right. is my modality. Right. And so for me, no matter what it is, if someone's in visual, it takes very little for me to understand because it's it's like, what well, you know, here's a concept I'd never considered here, Walt. They're actually, when someone speaks from a visual modality, it, it has vibration, connection to it, because everything we say and think is vibration. And That's so true. it's kind of like it comes to me, and I don't have to translate it because I'm also a visual. Well, you asked what someone, what it took for me. What what someone, I ended yeah, up. Yeah, someone who. Yeah, because I think you told me sound auditory was your main thing. Right, right. And what I realized is the whole concept of visualization wasn't dependent on being visual. It was dependent upon creating some kind of a model. In this case, a visual model that one can focus on and attach some feeling to and start to feel good about. And I realized, well, I've got four other senses. I ought to be able to do the same thing with one of those. I wasn't sure how to do it. I wasn't, I mean, visualizing, it's pretty easy, I guess, to explain that one. So, you know, once you've explained it, you've explained it. But translating that into auditory was a little bit tricky. Um, but like you said, my strongest uh, sense modality, if you will, is auditory. And once I figured out that that's what I needed to do, the next question was, okay, well, how do I create auditory uh, visual, not visualizations, but audioizations? <laughs> What's the word for that? <laughs> Audialization. How about that? <laughs> and, and in the audioization, it was just, it, it was something that I'd never really done before in terms of creating like a, a you know, like a, a picture, so to speak, a, a, a sound picture. So, that would, that would trip me up for quite some time. I wasn't quite sure what to do. In fact, I actually put it aside. I said, well, I'm going to keep doing this stuff, but I'm going to put that one aside because I don't know what to do with it. And then over time, what I realized is the various ways that I think auditorily, if you will, is basically the same thing as visualization. In other words... So do you have like words in your head? Like when you're focusing on something, do you have like inner dialogue or do you see words or do you hear... Like music, or how does that work for you? Well, we live in a very visual society, so I had to learn early on how to come up with my own equivalent of visualization. So if I'm in a classroom as a kid and they're trying to teach me something, they're trying to put a picture into my mind, since I didn't know how to create a picture, I would create an abstract structure. And I would put the abstract structure in my, my mind, and then i try to keep track of everything that was in that structure, kind of like seeing, a, I don't know, like a, a, a logic tree or something like that. 
And, you know, so I would put this piece of logic under that particular uh, antecedent and so on and so forth until I finally had this, this logical structure put together in place of the visual image that they were trying to show me. Um, so if I'm, I'm visualizing a, a Parisian street, okay, well, I know it has the uh, Arc de Triomphe, so I'll put that over here, and I know that it has, and I'm putting words over there, like a little block, you know, on a, on a block diagram. And then another block diagram over here for the Eiffel Tower, and, uh, you know, just take all the different pieces of it. And now I'm piecing together a picture of Paris. Of course, it's not really a picture at all, it's just a diagram, but that's the best I could do with it. And that's how I survived. In, but, in were school. You, but were you kind of using words and saying, I'm going to put the Eiffel Tower, and so the Eiffel Tower is what you focused on over here in your little diagram? I, I, the, when the I, when I focused on it, though, I, was, I wasn't focusing on a picture of it. I was focusing on a symbolic representation of it, if that makes it. sense. Yeah. You know, just even what in what little stuff we've just talked about, it's no wonder anybody can communicate. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the truth? <laughs> well, listen to all the gyrations yeah. <laughs> you're saying that you go through just to make sense of something. Well, that's what I, I mean, had to do in order pretty, to survive, in order to, to we do are well all, in school and so forth. As humans, we are all pretty gosh darn brilliant. We are. We're extremely adaptable. Yeah, so, yeah we're doing this stuff. Without even knowing we're doing it, yeah. except for when we talk like this, where we're going, let's break it apart. I mean, it's really amazing. Now, what took me a step further yeah. was when I realized how well I, re I remembered sound. So if I wanted to remember France or Paris, the first thought that came to my mind was what the national anthem of France sounds like. Wow. That's what I hear in my mind when I, when I think France, when I think Paris. That, that's like my that's starting point disgusting. for organizing, you know. Not, not that wow. I think that that's all that France is is the national anthem. I'm, I know it's not. No, but that's that's your connection. Yeah, that that's how I organize it logically. Yeah, and huh. and I also and realized you know, that I was really good at organizing auditorily. So, anytime I could find a musical connection, especially that worked well for me. See, now that makes me think of directions, and like how I know which way is which way. Mm -hmm. is I see a map of the United States in my head. Okay. And I've memorized that California, and I know what it looks like, mm -hmm. is on the left. And I know what the East Coast looks like, and it's on the right, you know, with Florida. And literally to this day, anytime I'm driving somewhere, if I see a sign and it says west or east, I have to create that picture of the United States in my head. <laughs> and I think to myself, I know I'm heading towards California, so take the, take the highway going west. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and as you were describing the map and f the shape of California and the shape of Florida, I realized that I have put together kind of a rudimentary form of a shape for each one. So I have kind of a big, you know, like a boot shape or a leg shape Florida with, with a kind of a weird panhandle <laughs> and then i have like a mm -hmm. a, a dog leg california <laughs> and it's not much more distinct <laughs> than that <laughs> oh my goodness i mean this kind of, this is the kind of stuff you know that to me it's one it's fascinating but two if we put like three four five people in a room and we all discuss this i'll bet we'd have three four and five different versions oh, of no how doubt. we interpret information no and doubt. store it in our mind. In fact, it's one of those things that takes, it can take sometimes a lifetime or, or half a lifetime just to figure out what your own modality is in terms yeah. that others would understand because I know for the longest time, I thought that the way I was dealing with it was the way everyone else was dealing with it. So I didn't think it was unusual. I didn't think it was different. And it's normal. Cause, well, if, if we do things a certain way, Unless someone tells you otherwise, I think we all think everybody thinks the same way as us. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think that's true. Until you find out they don't. <laughs> <laughs> Just to see if you're really on your toes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about yesterday I had a conversation with a, um, a gal who was calling, and she was interested possibly in hiring me as her coach. Oh, nice. And she, she said it was. She said, um, you know, she knows law of attraction, and, you know, she's trying her best to use it. Mm -hmm. And she was talking about how, you know, she she said she learned about it through the secret, which I know many people have. Sure. And she was trying to, like, visualize things, 
But what was fascinating is within our conversation, I could tell that as much as she was trying to visualize, she was missing some other key components to actually create what she desired. Uh-huh. Because what I've learned, you know, with law of attraction is that pictures alone don't cut it. Because That's true. even because like for me, for whatever the areas of my life that were really that I was really struggling in, somehow the pictures didn't seem to come naturally in my mind because I was really more focused on the lack of all the things that I desired. So for me, creating a vision board at least took pictures, and I didn't have to work on creating them in my head right. because I'd get them out of magazines, put them on this board, and like right now, I can visualize my, my vision board, mm-hmm. and that's a whole lot easier than trying to create the visions myself. Okay. But here's the thing. I could stare at a picture and go, uh-huh, I've, I didn't know why I still wasn't manifesting until I started to learn from Abraham Hicks that it was the feeling component mm. that was really the most important. And what I don't hear many people teaching is that the visualizing is kind of, for some people, depending on their modality, for some people it helps them move toward a feeling, but the feeling is what you're going after. And so I just kind of think it's interesting that in our society we talk a lot about visualization, but we leave out the kinesthetic component, the feeling, the emotion, the excitement component. Because if you don't have that, I can tell you, I can stare at a picture all day long and have almost no feeling. Yeah, that's not new to me. (laughs) If I'm wanting to create it and I'm not and I've been trying for a really long time, as a matter of fact, when I look at the picture, what's going on in my mind and the feelings I have is, how come I don't have it yet? Which is obviously the diametric opposite of what you want. Which is why I continue to create more of not getting what I wanted. Boy, we're good so, at this. <laughs> in that case, a picture or a visual didn't do it. Yeah. Yeah, it worked, so it worked, people the, the tell picture me, actually worked against hey, I'm, you. Hey, I'm visualizing, I'm visualizing, I'm trying my best, but mm-hmm. they're still not getting the results. I start to break it apart and say, but what are you feeling when you look at that picture? Yes. Or when you see that picture in your mind's eye? And yeah. then when I was talking to this lady, she was telling me all the things in her, she was, oh my goodness, she had this lovely story of all these negativities that are going on in her world. And I'm <laughs> like, well, that kind of answered that question. <laughs> yeah, pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so for her, the picture wasn't, it wasn't getting her in the direct, it wasn't getting movement for her to go where she wanted to go. And how could it, really? I mean, if you don't have the emotional connection going on, if you don't, if you are not in congruency, shall we say, between what you desire and what you're feeling about it, how could you produce any other result? And that's why lots of people don't deliberately produce what they're wanting. That's right. Yeah. I mean, it, it's just, it, and it's one of those things that you, you're right. It doesn't really get emphasized enough in what I call the law of attraction slash positive psychology slash positive thinking guru circles. I mean, they they talk a lot about the visualizing part. They talk a lot about the the three step process and all that. They don't spend as much time on the emotional component, and I'd say it's even more critical than the other part, really. Because it, it almost doesn't matter what you're visualizing. What matters is what you're feeling. Exactly. Because the feeling is actually, so even, it, it's the measurement of, of what even, you're actually even vibrating Even phrase to. positive psychology, it's, it's a lovely words, but what does it conjure up? I guess it depends on what, you know. what kind of psychology you've been reading. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go there. <laughs> that's right. That, that's exactly why I gave up on psychology when I was in college. I actually explored psychology with the idea of pursuing it. And I all I all it took was like the first 15 minutes of Psych 101 to realize this wasn't for me. Because hmm. it was all about abnormal psychology. It was all about dysfunctionality. And I said, well, that's not why I want to understand it. Maybe there are other people who want to understand it for that reason, but I don't want to understand it for that reason. I want to know where the good stuff is. <laughs> so I walked out on the course practically. I mean, I finished the course, but you know what I mean? I just It, it just I held do. no interest for me. And I didn't do very well on the course either because it just wasn't fun. 
wasn't interesting. So. Well, in a similar fashion, I had considered um, becoming like a licensed professional counselor. And I have nothing against licensed professional counselors. No, do I. I'm but married as to I one. Read, <laughs> as I read through the curriculum and as I kind of had a better understanding of what that meant in professional terms, what it really meant was you learn all these things, kind of like you said, which is the here's what doesn't work model. But then on top of it, there are regulations because you take, you know, state regula- uh, state tests. Oh, of course. And you're regulated by the state as to what you can do and what you can't do and what's what's necessary to do and what you can say and what you can't say. Right. And one of the things that I learned, and who knows if it's changed, but this is what I learned once upon a time, was that you cannot bring anything like spiritual-based into a counseling session. Sure. Because that kind of crosses the line of pastoral counseling slash, slash religion. Well, it also crosses the line of a person being able to handle the help that you're giving them. Because if if the help you're giving them is at cross purposes to their spiritual beliefs, you're dead. And that's exactly the point that I was about to make, which is I knew that my spiritual beliefs were every bit tied to everything about me. Mm. And if I couldn't introduce the concept at all or talk about any kind of spiritual-based understanding, I would be breaking the law. (laughs) So I went, well, how do I pursue this thing that I love, which is I love to help people move in their life from here to there um, without breaking the law? And I went, well, I guess becoming a licensed professional counselor is not it, but somehow, in some way, I still love doing that. And then I I started to learn NLP, which is Neuro Linguistic Programming, and it kind of helped me understand how the mind and the brain and thinking all work together. Mm-hmm. And that fascinated me. And I knew that if I pursued that kind of thinking and helped people, then I could add all the spiritual concepts I wanted. And so now people ask me, you know, like (laughs) yesterday, one of the first things out of my mouth was, do you believe that you're the creator of your own reality? And she said, yes. Now, I consider that a spiritual belief. I don't, what do you think? Do you think of that as spiritual or? That's an interesting question because for the longest time, I discounted spirituality at all. And then as I started to explore the law of attraction, I started to let spirituality back into my life. And now it's to the point where everything seems to have a spiritual basis. So I, I've kind of been like the pendulum that's gone way far to one side and way far to the other side. So asking me that question right now, is you're probably not going to get an objective answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, if you would have asked me 20 years ago, Um, Because I came from a very religious background, my whole set of filters about everything in life was, what does the Bible have to say about it? But more important, what do the specific preachers that I have been listening to say about what the Bible says about it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're you're, you're more on the norm than I was. I was at the other end of the extreme, but go ahead. Well, and so if, you know, asking me if I'm the creator of my own reality when I was in in some very religious belief systems, first of all, my head would have tilted. Like, (laughs) I don't even know what that question means. Yeah, right. (laughs) And then if I were to try to answer it, I would have quoted some Bible scripture telling you how I'm a creation of God or I'm a child of God, and I would have gone down that road. Um, But I believe that something outside of me managed the bigger things in my life. Um, and I don't know that I ever really understood what my part of it was. I think that's what I was always seeking, and that's why I landed where I am now. Okay. Because I love knowing I'm the creator of my reality. 
By the way, this is a uh, getting to know you session since this is our first day doing our Monday through Friday show, and you're getting to know us, and we're getting to know each other. Um, and if you want to be part of the conversation, feel free to call in. Uh, I'm not really expecting anybody to call in because I'm not sure what I would say if I was calling in. But the number, just in case you're interested, is 860-264-5432. We'd love to talk with you, 860-264-5432. But getting back to what you're talking about, Wendy, um, I mean – I understand what you mean about going after the Bible verses and so forth. For me, it was exactly diametrically the opposite because I was turned off by religion. I, I mean, I, and I studied it. I studied it pretty in depth. In fact, I'm one of the few people on the face of the planet who's actually read the Bible cover to cover in order. Oh, no, I've done it multiple times. You have. Okay. Well, I, I would oh, yeah. venture to say that the vast majority of Christians haven't done that, and I do that. True. I say that based on experience because I've asked them about it. <laughs> and, <laughs> And, and once I've asked them about it and they say, well, no, they haven't, I say, well, you know, are you aware that the Bible says this and this and this? And I get these cross-eyed looks. So that kind of reinforces for me that I was on the right track anyway. But <laughs> but by the time I was done reading the book, I said to myself, I, this isn't for me. <laughs> I mean, this this just resonates wrongly so many ways for me. So that was why I actually became non-spiritual. I pushed spirituality out of my life. Now, and, what age range were you when 14. you were reading the Bible through? 14. Oh, my gosh. You were really young to be tackling something as big as the Bible. Yeah, I was always an early starter on everything. <laughs> oh. I mean, that was just See, my, now, that was my me, MO. I, I, I was sort of – well, not sort of. I was introduced to the whole concept of, of you know, religion based on – my mother really got very involved, and then it was just kind of like, and you're all, you're all coming with us to church. And that mm -hmm. was just kind of how I grew up. Oh, yeah, me too. So, for me, it kind of bypassed that critical, you know, filter because I was so young, that part of me that, like, really makes decisions to choose yes or no wasn't really there. I was really just under the influence of where my parents said to go is where I went, and what they said to believe is what I believed. Um well, that, the same but thing happened to me, too. I mean, I, I followed very much the same route, and I, I went because I was expected to go, and that's what our family did every Sunday and so forth. But what happened over time is I, I was actually listening. I was paying attention. And mm -hmm. over time, I was realizing this isn't working. This, is, this feels so wrong to me. I, and I didn't dare verbalize that. If I had said that, I don't know what would have happened, but I didn't dare say it, not even slightly. So I just kept it to myself, but it's just kind of building up inside of me over time. So by the time I was 14, I was in earnest, ready to read the whole Bible to find out what the heck this thing was all about and trying to make sense out of it. So it shows we can have two entirely different approaches, two, two entirely different reactions, I should say, to the same basic experience of being indoctrinated from an early age. Wow. Well, this, I know that this program is really not about, you know, religion. No, it's not. I don't know how we yes got there, no. actually. But... <laughs> I could so go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and maybe maybe we'll take it in chunks, little bits at a time. <laughs> it's probably a good idea. And small chunks, little tiny ones, you know, <laughs> the digestible size. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the back to the concept, you know, are you the creator of your own reality? I love being able to say yes and know what that means today. Mm. What, what does and, that mean to you now? How would you phrase that? How would you well, express it? Well, I, I remember how I was introduced to it. I don't remember the people, places, and things, but I remember conceptually that when I started to take on the concept that I was in, in control of what I created – me being the control freak that I was, mm -hmm. that was very exciting because I now knew I got to control more than I thought it was in my control. <laughs> but the biggest reason I totally bought into the concept is I realized that if I truly got to create my reality and I got to be in control of or, or have some deliberate control over the people, places, and things in my life, it meant for the first time I was no longer at the mercy of people outside of me. Mm. And it didn't mean I wouldn't still connect with them. No, of course not. But it meant if I have um, a relationship with somebody that's not going well, well, what is it in me? What are my beliefs? What are my thoughts? What am I vibrating to that's mismatching with them? And what I found was as I, if, if let's say, I was a mismatch with someone in a way that didn't feel good, and then I kind of did my own 
exploration as to what about that doesn't feel good to me, if I cleaned that up and all of a sudden I had some new thoughts and beliefs about something and I now was feeling more neutral about them, Mm -hmm. one of two things would happen. Okay. Either I would now draw out of that other person the things that now were more pleasant for me where we were a match or somehow some way we would somehow disconnect and not really be in each other's lives for a while ah. or forever. Okay. And like I, I'm, I'm thinking of, I have one friend um, that I'm thinking of. Um, I think of her like family. We're not blood family, but we think of each other as family and I adore her. And I noticed over the last couple of years, she had been really going through some difficult times. Hmm. And when we would speak, she really only, where she was, she was focusing so much on the pain in her body and the negative things going on in the family that that kind of overwhelmed our conversation. Isn't that interesting how that happens? I mean, the fact is that, that all she was doing was just, you know, Basically, using you as a sounding board and saying this is what's going on in my life, but it drove you crazy. I know that kind of thing drives me crazy. Well, if she wants to turn it around, I'm the perfect person to talk to mm-hmm. because I'm more than happy to help somebody take their current story that's not working for them and help turn it around because all it for her, but she's not seeing the possibilities of other ways to view the situation. And for many years and often, You know, she could call me and just use me as a sounding board, and we'd turn it around, and by the end, she was feeling great about the very same thing she felt horrible about at the beginning of the call. Mm -hmm. But she also knows that that's what she can expect from me. Right. And I started to notice that when we'd start to have conversation, I would just kind of tiptoe in the direction of trying to turn the story a little bit in a more positive way. And I noticed she was resistant to it. She didn't mm-hmm. want to go there. Yeah. She really wanted to hold on to her painful story and her struggles. I've maintained and, for quite some time that we that addiction goes far beyond drugs and alcohol and sex and all that kind of stuff. It actually goes into the more mundane areas of our lives because I think addiction is just being stuck on something. And what you're describing is somebody who is just stuck on something. She was stuck on a viewpoint. And that viewpoint was, I need to look every, at the negative side of everything. She wasn't ready to turn it around. No. And you know what? Who am I to tell her she has to? Yeah, true. Yeah. Okay, now, I take it back. Years ago, I would tr- do my best to push my perspective down other people's throats. Like, you must listen to it, listen to what I say, and you must change your mind and see it my way. <laughs> <laughs> but... That didn't make a whole lot of friends. <laughs> no, it doesn't work so, real well. And I have a lot of experience with that one, so I know it doesn't work real well. <laughs> so I can't say I'm a little bit more mature in that area. And so what I'm noticing with this friend and I, I still love her and adore her. I still will always think of her as family. And I recognize that for now, she's going through some, some things, and we're really just not a match. And because I don't feel the need to change her or fix her, because it's not my job and it's not my responsibility, nor did she ask me, that we just don't have as much in common at this time. Right. But I've been through this kind of thing with other people, both friends and family, all my life, and I recognize, you know, things ebb and flow, and maybe in a year or now, a year from now, she'll be in a different place in her life, and then all of a sudden we'll reconnect. So it's not like I have to, like, check her off the list going, she's out of my life, never going to talk to her again. But yeah, you never know what's going to happen. It, it could turn around just because she comes to some sort of a crisis and decides she doesn't like the road that she's on, and all of a sudden you have a brand new opening and a brand new opportunity to reestablish the relationship. So you never know what's going to happen. Exactly. exactly. But in the past, I used to you know, blow people off and go, you're not a match for me, you're out of here. <laughs> and now I'm much more forgiving. Forgiving is good. Um, in fact, uh, but sometimes it's a lot for people to handle. <laughs> well, <laughs> and I don't, I don't want to push myself on them. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's why I kind of follow the rule of thumb. I wait for them to ask me for help and try not to jump in in between. <laughs> try to just well, wait it for me, it. It took me many, many, many years to realize that not everybody wants help. Yeah, that's or true. that not everybody wants what I have to offer. 
And so or both, I actually. Do they, they, they may want the help, but just not necessarily what you have. <laughs> one time, that reminds me, one time I was talking with my mother, and she was in a, a crisis point in her life, and she was she was looking for help, and she was, you know, saying, Wendy, I know that you can figure this out. Help me, help me. So I'm like, okay, so we're talking through it, and I'm kind of working with her like I'm her coach, mm-hmm. and that was the role she was asking me to play. Okay. And I asked her some question, and she just flat out said, I don't, I don't want to go down that road. Ah. And I said, well, Mom, I really know that the answers that you're seeking are on the other side of this question. Mm. She goes, I don't want to even touch that. Yeah. I said, okay, well, do you realize that by saying you're not going to play this game with me anymore, that you're not going to get the solution that you're seeking? And she goes, okay, then I guess I won't. I was so shocked Mm. because this is something she's been complaining about for decades. And we got really close to where the solution was for her. And now I knew why she never got to the other side. Mm -hmm. Because she created her own resistant wall that she has never allowed herself to go to the other side of or even explore. You know, one of my co-hosts, my former co-host, Joel Elston, who, by the way, is going to be coming back to do a once a week uh, show with me. So I'm looking forward to that. But he used to tell us. Yeah. But he used to tell a story. um, I think he told it once or twice um, on the air. But it, it was a great story that really illustrates in a in a kind of a different way what you're just talking about right there. He talks about a client who came in to see him. Now, Joel is a psychotherapist. He is licensed and so forth. He's kind of unusual because he, in in a very positive and in a very determined way, includes the law of attraction and the teachings of the law of attraction in his therapeutic work. So he's very kind of out there compared to most therapists on that point. He's also had tremendous success with it. So the bottom line is he ends up getting uh, referrals often from other therapists when the therapist has kind of run into a wall and doesn't really know what to do with the person. You know, so these are like the get last gasp. Okay, here's your last chance. Otherwise, you're on your own. (laughs) (laughs) That kind of situation, right? So he gets one of these calls. It's a young lady. And the lady comes into his office and sits down. And he asks her, so what's going on? And she spends the next 10 minutes or so talking about how ever since her boyfriend broke up with her some two years before, all these things had gone wrong in her life. And he didn't start counting immediately, but he realized pretty quickly he should have been because there was a pattern going on that was very strong. Every single thing that went wrong in her life was in some way connected to her boyfriend dumping her two years before. And so he put up with it for about 10 minutes, which is a long time for Joel. (laughs) No, I'm I'm kidding, Joel. If you're listening, you're actually very good at listening. But the point is he likes to to get to the heart of it quickly. He doesn't mess around. And so he didn't mess around in this case either. And he said something in a very kind way. He said, do you realize that every single thing that you have brought up that has been a problem in your life, you are tying back to your boyfriend? And I'm just wondering what it's going to take for you to decide that your boyfriend doesn't dominate your life anymore. At which point, she got red in the face, jumped up, grabbed her things, and stormed out of the office. And he said, well, I guess that's the end of that client. (laughs) Not going to see her anymore. (laughs) I guess I kind of touched a hot spot. (laughs) Yeah. Well, interestingly enough, he did hear from her again. About two days later, she called back and she said, first of all, she apologized for walking out. And then she also apologized for the way she'd reacted, saying she didn't want to hear that. But after she calmed down a bit and had thought about it for a bit, she realized that there's there's some truth to it. And she even recognized her own reaction as being an indicator that there was truth to it. So he thought, whoa, this is great. So he invited her back in for another session. She came in for the session. They went through some more of that kind of stuff. And then toward the end, he said to her, You've got a lot that you're trying to let go of there. Let's let's see if we can just set something up to make it easier for you. Here's what I want you to do. It's Friday, so I want you to call some of your girlfriends or just friends, any male or female, doesn't matter, friends particularly who you know you can trust to have your back, so to speak, and say to them, you know, I haven't talked to you in a while, but I really need to get out. Let's go out and paint the town. 
and see what they say and, and see how many of them you can get to go with you. And then I just want you to go out and don't give any thought to the ex-boyfriend. Don't give any thought to any of the difficulties you've had. Just go out and have as much fun as you can possibly have. Now, this is after they had been working a little bit on the idea of you know, the boyfriend not being in her life anymore. He doesn't have any influence on her anymore. You know, but they, after they've done a bit of that, it, it's it's hard. You know, when, you, when you're first facing up to something, it's a lot of work. You put out a lot of energy. So he's saying, blow it off now. Just Just go out there and have a good time. He got a phone call from her the next morning, and she called him up in this really excited voice and said, Joel, I just had the best night of my life. <laughs> and she went on to oh. go on and on about how wonderful a time her friends had had, and they'd gone and done this and that and the other thing. And it was the best thing that had happened to her in years. So here we have, in a very compressed time frame, Somebody who was stuck on something, broke free of it, and then experienced the immense joy that comes from what happens after you break free of it within like a three-day space. <laughs> I mean, talk about compressing your time frames. But it, well, it just goes to illustrate how difficult it can be to break away and how great it can be when you do break away from whatever it is you're stuck on. And that is really a perfect illustration of the law of attraction at work. Oh, yeah. Because... She was so stuck on a set of thoughts that didn't serve her, that caused her a lot of pain, and being willing to at least experiment with not focusing on them. You know, Joel gave her something else to focus on that completely distracted her from that other stuff, and now she got to experience thinking very differently than how she was thinking before. And, you know, when we think different and when we feel different, our point of attraction as to what the law of attraction brings to us is very different. Yeah, I mean, she snapped her law of attraction needle into a completely new position in a really short period of time. And it was a big shift. That's not the kind of shift most people have, but she did. And more power to her because, I mean, that's, that's tremendous when you can do that. And honestly, those are the kinds of breakthroughs I love to, I, those, that is what I look to do with my clients. Mm, yeah. Because I don't like to do stuff slow, unless somebody really is after slow, but most people just want the change and they want it now. And so I don't like to do what, you know, some people call slow therapy. I like to do fast. <laughs> and it's all about get to the thoughts that aren't working and let's find what thoughts do work. Mm. And once you find them, you don't ever go back to those other thoughts because you you recognize, ooh, those are icky. <laughs> yeah, you don't go back to them so, consciously. It, it is possible for your subconscious to, to feed them to you. I've experienced quite a bit of that. But once you know what they are, you're right, you don't want to go back to them. Yeah, I mean, I want to have everything out in the open, conscious awareness of what doesn't work, as well as conscious awareness now of what does work. Mm. Um, have you ever heard of um, a guy named Bill Harris? Yeah. Where do I know that name from? Uh, Centerpoint Institute Holosync Technology. No, nope. not, ring not ringing a bell there. Bill Harris, though, sounds familiar from something. I, give me a half an hour, and I'll, you know, probably after the show is okay. done, I'll know. You know? <laughs> well, you know, one of the things that he says that once I really understood it, I catch myself experiencing what he's talking about and it's phenomenal and so what he says is if at any point you start to witness yourself doing a behavior that doesn't serve you in the moment you're that witness it's like your unconscious mind comes awake it recognizes holy cow I'm doing this thing that doesn't work for me mm -hmm. and then your unconscious mind reorganizes itself in order to produce a set of behaviors that does work for you. That's so, an interesting claim uh, because that, that's not what my early experience was. It is now, but it wasn't early on. Well, I don't, I don't know that I've ever been able to deliberately make that happen. Oh, okay. But when I, when I get into a place where I notice that I'm witnessing something that doesn't work in my life, the moment I have that great awareness, I do have I do know that from experience I never do that negative thing again. I hmm. never do that thing that doesn't work for me ever again. Do you get thoughts about it even though you weren't willing to take an action toward the negative thing? Say that again, please. 
Do, do you get thoughts about the negative thing, even though you are no longer willing to take action toward the negative thing? No. No, it's almost as though that negative programming just stopped running and doesn't work, and it's almost forgotten. Okay, now it's I'm officially like you... jealous right now. <laughs> because... Well, and I'll, I'll give you an example of, of this, because this is the first time, like I'd heard Bill say this many times, but I'm going to tell you an experience I had that was the first time that I went, oh, that's that thing that Bill Harris talks about. Yeah. <laughs> so I was um, in my office, and I work from home, so I'm in my office, and my boss calls me on the phone, and we're having one of our weekly conversations, and I typically did not have a great relationship with him because our communication style was so different from each mm, other. Yeah. Um, plus, I think there were other issues. But nonetheless, you know, when I knew I had to talk to him, it wasn't like, oh, yippee. It was more like, huh. So we're having a conversation. <laughs> yeah, that, w- being- that wouldn't work for me either. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just being the business professional I am, and I'm listening to what he has to say. And something got said that in the moment he said it, I immediately went from everything's just going normal to, ugh, this is the thing that feels so painful. Mm. And I, I ha- here's where I knew I was witnessing what was happening. It was like I was me witnessing me because I immediately noticed that I started to hunch my shoulders and shrink down in my chair, and I started to feel myself like I was a little girl. Mm, wow. I mean, this happened in, in a nanosecond. Mm. And because I had the awareness, like, and I think this had happened dozens and dozens and dozens of times before, but this time I witnessed myself responding to him. And as I was shrinking in my chair, feeling like I'm about to be the little girl, I felt like a victim, like he was a mean dad being critical. And in that moment, I sat myself up, and I went back into being the powerful female professional that I know I am. Wow. And I responded appropriately. And in this case, it was, no, I disagree. And he did not say anything except let the disagreement be there. And we finished up our, our conversation, and we hung up the phone. But there was, like, no tension or anything. It was like that situation happened as though that happened all the time. But what I recognized the moment I got off the phone is how he so represented my father, who was very critical of me always, but in particular when I was a child, this is where that memory went back to. And what I realized was when a male figure who's in authority, because he's my boss, he's in authority, starts to disagree with me or criticize me, I immediately shrunk in my mind into my that little girl about four, five, six years old. Wow. Hmm. And from that moment forward, I never shrunk back into the little girl again, ever. I, he continued to be my boss, I think, for another three years. My goodness. And when I'd have when I had conversations with him in the future, they were not difficult for me at all. As a matter of fact, sometimes I'd get off the phone and I'd think to myself. Well, he said something in the way, in the past, it would really upset me, but instead it made me laugh. <laughs> Which is it a nice... It was like I was a, I was it... a different person, and well... that's how I recognize that when you witness yourself doing something that does not serve you, I didn't have to go to therapy. I didn't have to say, oh, what's the new belief, or what should I believe? It's like, boom, I was a different person, mm. and I acted differently, and it was like, oh. Yeah, oh, that's a lovely kind of transition to make, especially when you made it so easily and so quickly like that. That's just, that's that's the ultimate in self-empowering. It's fantastic. It was fabulous. <laughs> Interesting, too, how, I mean, I'm, I, I was hearing your side of it, obviously, the, the, the way it was making you feel in terms of your, your past history and how, uh, it was making you feel like the little girl and all that kind of thing. I was also thinking about it from the way it felt on his side, because my wife has taught me quite a bit about how um, people, particularly who have domineering type characteristics or or uh, other behavioral issues, maybe they're bullies, you know, whatever it might be, they tend to not react the, the way you would expect they react when they're challenged in some way. And and you challenged him by saying, "No, I disagree." You you probably in some way, I don't know what was in your mind, but in some way you had conjured up an idea of how you thought he would react 
Whereas from his perspective, if somebody disagrees with him, I suspect that happens a lot with him. I, I suspect he gets a lot of people disagreeing, so he's used to it. So it's just like, oh, well, there's just another example of it. But that was not at all a match with what you thought was going to happen. And that's what's so interesting to me. People can be in the same conversation and have two completely different viewpoints about how it's going to go. I just rem- no, my dad never hit me. He was not physically abusive. Glad to hear but it. But I have I have this um, like visual while you were talking, like I was a kid and I put my hands over my head like don't hit me. Mm. Oh, but it wasn't about the physical thing. It was like I just wanted to hide from the backlash sure. of what he was going to say to me. Well, verbal abuse and- can be just as bad as physical abuse in some ways. And that's how I felt when I was with my boss. And I'll tell you, he, my boss was a very kind, kind man, mm. um, very well loved and revered by so many people. But I recognize, you know, here's, here's to me a big law of attraction principle. What I matched in him was the thing that I constantly was recreating was men who were authority figures that would match this criticalness that I had with my dad mm. because that's what was in my vibrational being. And that's ultimately... And so I, that, talk about being the creator of your own reality. This is what I kept recreating over and over is uncomfortable situations where I was being criticized by male authorities. Right. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. You kept recreating it ultimately. And I guess what you really mean when you said that you shifted and never went back again is you stopped recreating it. You didn't. You, you didn't Absolutely. set yourself up anymore after that. That's, that that creation was now obsolete, and it was no longer necessary to be recreated. Because I believe that the reason we, I don't know how to say this. Um, part of the recreation is it's going to keep being created until you have a different thought. Mm-hmm. And in that moment, I witnessed myself shrinking into little girl victim who was about to feel like, "Oh, I'm being criticized." In that moment, I recognized that's what I was thinking. And when I put my shoulders up and my shoulders back and I went back into the stature of I'm a professional adult, I start. I held on to I'm a professional adult. I know how to be this woman because I, I am that woman in all my other professional relationships. I just wasn't when it came to authoritative male figures in my business world. And now, so in that moment, my belief changed, and I was now focused on something very different, which is I'm a professional adult. Now, i got to ask you, what, yeah. what do you think was the, the difference maker that, for whatever reason, this time you decided not to go back in, into the old pattern anymore? What, why, why didn't you fall back into the pattern this time, and why is it that you never went back as a result? Um, two things that I can think of. One of them was I was aware that this pattern was running continually, and I was asking questions like, how do I shift out of this? Mm-hmm. How do I maintain my composure as a professional adult I am and not succumb to this thing that I did? Mm, yeah. so I think that was the first thing. Then, because that was something I was seeking an answer to, I had started reading some books, um, and one of them had to do with how women in particular tend to shrink and or, or not get the corner office or they don't get the promotion. And so I kind of armed myself with some new information, and it caught, that's how I recognized I am a professional most of the time. Ah, <laughs> uh-huh. Okay. So I believe it all came from I was asking and seeking an answer to this question. And so I think I just happened to have been receptive in that moment to receive that awareness. Well, I hope you're going to be receptive to this because, believe it or not, the hour is up. (laughs) (gasps) Holy cow. It happens every time, Wendy. You're going to have to get used to it, but it, it, it just flies on by. Before we lose everybody, if someone's interested in doing some coaching with you, how can they reach you? Easiest way to find me is through my website, which is wendydillard.com. 
and there you will find my email address as well as my phone number, and I'd be more than happy to talk with you. And if you haven't subscribed to the podcast, please do so because it's going to be this good every single time. Subscribe at LOAToday.net. If you are on iPhone, you can also subscribe uh, in the iTunes store, and if you are on Android, you can subscribe in Google Play. And, Wendy, it's been a pleasure. Oh, this is fun. Let's Absolutely. do it again tomorrow. <laughs> Sounds good. We'll see you all tomorrow here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye, everyone.